Thank you.
survival strategies at a time of conquest. My name is Nicholas Morton, and I am Associate Professor and Course Leader at Nottingham Trent University. And I specialize in things like the Crusades, the medieval Middle East, and of course, the Mongols, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. So without any further ado, I'm going to get started. And we're going to be thinking today not so much about the Mongols themselves. We're going to be thinking about uh, everyone else, the people on their invasion path. What do you do when a Mongol army comes over the horizon and you have to decide what you're going to do next? And we're not talking about morality here. We're not talking about what a morally good or bad response looks like. We're simply talking about what response means that you get to survive and which ones don't. And so it's with that in mind, I thought I'd begin by giving an overview of the Mongol invasions into the Middle East. Because we're going to be looking at the Middle East as our main case study for um, the Mongol invasions. So let's turn to this map. So you can see here a map of the Middle East. And this is the Middle East at about the time 1218, that sort of time. And by that year, Chinggis Khan, or Genghis Khan, as he's more colloquially known, he is in the process of creating a massive empire for himself in Central Asia. He's already consolidated Mongolia itself, conquering its various different communities. He's conquered various neighboring civilizations. And he staged several serious invasions into northern China. But he hasn't got as far as the Middle East yet, and he hasn't got as far as Eastern Europe. And so we're looking at the Middle East, and a crucial moment in this process occurs if you look at the top, well, it's on the right, top right hand side of the screen for me, um, at the border town of Utra. And something rather peculiar happens here because. A group of Mongol merchants arrive at Utra and they're imprisoned by the local governor, someone called Inalchuk. And we don't know why. Perhaps he thought they were spying. Perhaps he thought that they, there had been some misbehavior on their part. Or perhaps this was an aggressive move. We're not quite sure. Either way, he imprisoned them. And then he sent word back to the his overlord, the ruler of the Khwarazmian Empire, which is a huge empire embracing what today we much of, well, the entirety of modern day Iran, much of modern day Iraq, as well as many sort of peripheral areas. And the ruler of the Khwarazmian Empire gives a very clear instruction to Inalchuk that the Mongol merchants who have been imprisoned should all be executed, all of them. Inalchuk duly carries out that instruction. But he doesn't can carry out that instruction to the letter because one of those Mongol merchants escapes and makes it back to Chinggis Khan. Now, needless to say, Chinggis Khan is incensed and within a matter of weeks turns up outside Utra with a massive invasion army. Now, much of this begs the question of why Inalchuk so deliberately provoked the wrath of what is increasingly becoming the global superpower, either way, he did. And as a result, Chinggis Khan invaded the borders of the Khwarazmian Empire. And over the next two years, much of the central and eastern portion of the Khwarazmian Empire fell to the Mongols. And within that period, the Mongols sent out a reconnaissance force uh, technically, its purpose was to hunt down the Khwarazmian Sultan. In practice, it conducted a lot of scouting as well. And that reconnaissance force went south under the Caspian Sea or below the Caspian Sea. And then up through greater Armenia, the kingdom of Georgia, through the Caucasus, into what today be southern Russia, where it defeated a Rus force at the Battle of Kalka River before returning to, across the north of the Caspian Sea back to Mongol territory. And between those two ventures, the fall of the Eastern Khwarazmian Empire and that scouting expedition, 
it becomes clear to the remaining peoples of the Middle East that they are now facing a massive invasion. And the major societies that are left in the Middle East are the Ayyubid Empire, that's the empire ruled by Saladin's descendants, the Anatolian Seljuks, a Turkish sultanate, what's left of the Byzantine Empire, marked here as Byzantine Nicaea, and the Crusader states, which are the territories in the Middle East established a century and a bit previously by the armies of the First Crusade. Now, they all have to decide what they're going to do, because it's clear the Mongols are coming. So how are they going to respond? And it has to be said that for some of them, at least, there is little need to respond, because as far as, the, as, far as they're concerned, some powers think the Mongols are coming to save them. And this is the case for the Crusader states. Because in 1218, while the Atra incident is taking place, a massive crusading army was invading Egypt. And it was making heavy weather of it. It wasn't doing particularly well, but it did manage to take the coastal city of Damietta. And it's at this point that news arrives that there is an army, a mysterious army, coming out of the east, they're not quite sure who it is, and is marching towards the Middle East, or towards the sort of, towards Syria and the coastal regions of the Middle East. And the Crusaders soon think they know who this is. They think this is the army of Prester John. And Prester John is a mythical priest emperor, very common and popular myth in Western Christendom at this time, who is believed to live in the Indies, which is a rather sort of, in this period, a rather sort of undefined area. It's not as simple as being India. And Prester John is thought to rule over an empire of monsters. Yes, you did hear me right, as well as humans. He has mountains containing dragons and an island off the coast that contains the fountain of eternal youth, obviously. Uh, so the legends go. And the rumour here is that the rumours of an invading army are, in fact, the first reports of the advance of Prester John into the Middle East, advancing to support the Crusader states and to facilitate their reconquest of Jerusalem, which had been lost to the Crusader states about 30 years previously. So initially, for them at least, there's no need to respond to the, to the, to the Mongols or press to John as they believe them to be, because they think they're coming to their help. But it doesn't take long for that particular rumour to become exploded. Let's move forward. So after that initial foray into the Middle East, there's a lull, and it lasts for about 10 years. And during that time, there's a great deal of fighting in the Middle East, um, the main line of conflict being between the Anatolian Seljuk Sultanate, which you can see here in the center of what's today modern day Turkey, and the Ayyubid Empire of Egypt and Syria, which, as I've mentioned, is the empire founded originally by Saladin. And those two sultanates are locked in conflict, and they remain locked in conflict, both with each other and what's left of the Khwarazmian Empire for much of the 1220s. And so in, 12, in 1230, there is a massive battle which consumes all three of those powers, the Seljuks, Ayyubids, and what's left of the Khwarazmians. And the Khwarazmians lose very badly, but it's a, it's a closely fought battle. And literally within weeks of those three major powers fighting each other to a standstill, the Mongols launch their new massive invasion into the Middle East. They didn't plan it to coincide with this battle, but nonetheless, it worked in their favor that they did. And so the Mongol commander, a man called Chormakun, he spearheads the Mongol invasion, and that invasion rolls up what's left of the Khwarazmian Empire, as well as taking the Kingdom of Georgia, or forcing it to accept a client status, I should say, and conquering Greater Armenia in the Caucasus. So you can see that's the beginning of a sort of a phase by phase approach to invasions. The Mongols don't do this all in one single swoop. The first phase was 1218 to 1221. 
The next is 12.30. And in 12.43, uh, Chalmacun's successor, called Baichu, as governor of this region, invaded the Anatolian Seljuk Sultanate and forced it to accept a client status. So we move forward. And then there is another lull, this time for a little bit more than 10 years, because in 1222, a new uh, Mongol great Khan in Mongolia sends his brother to complete the conquest of the Middle East. And for context, by this time, the Mongols have reached the borders of Eastern Europe and have sacked Poland and Hungary. They're making substantial inroads into China. And so by this point, the Mongol Empire is expanding very quickly indeed on multiple fronts, including the Middle East. Well, Hulagu is sent by his brother to um, essentially destroy what's left of resistance in the Middle East. And he begins in Persia, modern day Iran, by attacking and overthrowing the strongholds of the assassins. That is the Ismaili Nazari sect of Shia Islam, who famously um, conducted a great many political assassinations in order to maintain themselves and to fend off their enemies. Well, the Mongols overthrow what's left of their strongholds in 1256. 1258, the Mongols then advance on Baghdad, which is one of the largest cities in the world at this time, and the main city of the Abbasid Caliphate. And in 1258, with enormous loss of life, the Mongols overthrow Baghdad. 1260, the Mongols invade northern Syria and destroy the Syri northern Syrian margins of the Ayyubid Empire. And by this time, oh, there's an error in the map. By this time, Egypt has fallen as well, not to the Mongols, but to the Ayyubid's own enslaved people. There's a phenomenon in Ayyubid Egypt, and that's with many parts of the Muslim world, where rulers depend very heavily on slave soldiers for their armies. And the Ayyubids in Egypt relied a little bit too heavily because in 1250, the Ayyubids in Egypt, their uh, enslaved people rose up and overthrew the Ayyubids, creating a new empire for themselves centered on Egypt called the Mamluk Empire. So the Mongols advance into Syria, which they take. The Crusader states conduct, conduct some fairly frantic diplomacy with the Mongols, and they're trying basically to avoid getting invaded. It doesn't really work, but the Crusader states do survive. And it's at, and it's at this point in 1260, the Mamluks advance out of Egypt and in order to face the Mongols. Now, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger now because we'll pick that one up uh, in a little bit. But what I'm hoping I've given you is a whistle-stop tour of the political history of this era. These are the events against the, the, the background that we will be talking about when it comes to explaining the Mongol Empire, its advance, and crucially, how people responded to it. So let's just, before we move on to those responses, let's talk a little bit about the Mongol war machine. Why was it so successful? Because just to take the Middle East without reference to Central Asia or China or Eastern Europe or anywhere else, no one really proves able to deter or defend themselves against the Mongols. The Mongols defeat everyone. And that includes the armies of the Khwarazmian Sultanate, which are a sort of mix of nomadic and um, nomadic soldiers mixed with the, sort of the soldiers of an agricultural society. You've got the armies of Greater Armenia and the Kingdom of Georgia, the Ayyubid Empire, the Anatolian Seljuk Sultanate. They've all got their various forms of warcraft and the Mongols defeat all of them. So how do they do it? Well, there are some inherent advantages in the Mongol war machine. They are ultimately, for the most part, a nomadic people. And nomadic peoples in this era, they raise their children to ride, hunt and shoot from pretty much as early as they can walk. 
uh, whilst those are not military skills per se, they lend themselves to military endeavours very easily. But these are fairly common nomadic skills, and indeed many of the societies in the Near East have those same skills too. So what made the Mongols so much more effective? Well, another way of looking at this is the Mongols' ability to learn. The Mongols are very um, keen to pick up skills and technologies from the various peoples they conquer. And so when the Mongols invade northern China, uh, they realize how efficient and effective Chinese siege engineers are. And so as a result, they recruit them, or I'm not sure they're given much choice, but nonetheless, Chinese siege engineers are therefore found in the Mongol army thereafter. Another strength in the Mongol war machine is the way the Mongols build out their armies, because when the Mongols conquer a society, they will often, con they will often conduct um, massacres, particularly in major cities. Excuse me a minute. But nonetheless, if they see some troops they like the look of, they will want to enroll them into Mongol society. So if you're a defeated army, the Mongols are quite likely to say, well, we want you now to fight for us. And you're not actually given a choice about this. You're going to fight for the Mongols. Because what the Mongols do is they'll break up your army, your defeated army, and they will then input all your troops into the Mongols' system. And so the Mongols have what's called the decimal system. And that means that you have units of 10 soldiers, and then 10 units of 10 soldiers in a company of 100, 10 companies of 100 in a regiment of 1,000, 10 regiments of 1,000 in a division of 10,000, with commanders at every level. And so you put inputted into that structure. And if you fight for the Mongols, all well and good. But if you don't fight for the Mongols, if you refuse, if you say, why should I? Well, not only will they kill you, but they'll kill your unit as well. And so your defiance places your entire unit at risk. And if your unit refuses to cooperate, then the Mongols will kill your company as 100 people. So the bottom line is this. You're going to fight whether you like it or not. So with every victory, the Mongols get stronger and bigger as they go on. Another advantage is it's a straightforward one, really. It's terror. But once you defeated one civilization, the next civilization is going to be wary. When you defeated 20, then any future adversary, their armies will be backing away from the battlefield even before you've crossed the horizon because they know they're not going to win. And so a momentum builds up. And of course, within that momentum is the experience being gained by the Mongol armies, the confidence being um, built up, just as their future opponents' confidence is dwindling, all of which makes it so much easier to conquer more peoples going forward. And so as a result, there are plenty of envoys who go to the Mongol Empire, often because they want to try and conduct diplomacy and avert imminent disaster, but also because they want to try and work out how they're going to defeat this Mongol war machine. And so I'm going to introduce you to a Franciscan friar called John of Pliano Carpini. And he was sent by the Pope to the Mongols. And it seems very likely that one of his main tasks was to work out how on earth the Mongols were to be defeated. And the answer is, you're just not going to do it. Um, Carpini came back. He said, well, there's a few things you can do. Mongols are worried about crossbows, so use those. But otherwise, he basically said you should adopt the Mongols' own tactics because they're the best thing going. And you, it's your only real chance of meeting them on anything like equal terms. He had some stories about fantastical and fictional ways of defeating the Mongols, but those wouldn't be very helpful. But I will just share one with you because it's it's quite interesting. He said that he had heard reports that there was a people in the far north where it's very cold who have successfully defeated a Mongol invasion. And this is how they did it. Well, the people in this region, apparently the men 
look a great deal like dogs. In fact, in some stories, it's rendered as werewolves. And so when the Mongols um, army approach, these men jump into the nearby, so they roll on the ground. They roll on the ground and get their fur full of dirt and muck and sand and dust. And then they jump into a nearby frozen stream so that the mud becomes wet and their, their fur full of mud freezes. And then they allow that freezing process to take place, at which point they then charge at the Mongols. So the Mongols then discharge all their arrows, but the arrows bounce off these, as they're described, wolf men. And it bounces off their fur because their fur is now a frozen, icy carapace. And as a result, the Mongols um, are defeated. Now, of course, you're not going to repeat. You're not going to repeat that victory because this is a fictional tale. But nonetheless, people are asking, how is it to be done? How are the Mongols supposed to be defeated? How can this be achieved? And really, at this point, no one's got any answers. So against that background and against the, back, against the expectation that you're not going to win, what do you do next? What's your next move? Because naturally, people aren't going to roll over and die. They've got to do something. So let's begin by talking about people who the Mongols actually conquered. And here, um, as I conducted my, my research on this, it's um, I'm always reminded of the, the very common narrative structure in Hollywood films. And the narrative structure goes something like this, that a country is invaded. The people are oppressed. The oppression builds up to a point at which someone says, enough, we have suffered enough, this has to stop. And then a group of zealous, like-minded people uh, gather around this leader. There's a montage as they train and get weapons and build up their armies. And then in the last 30 minutes of the film, there's a big old battle and the invader gets defeated and sent back to their home or whatever, and peace and harmony reign supreme, etc. Now, I'm sure we can all think of movies that have that basic plot. But actually, that's not what happens here. The Mongols invade, yes. The Mongol invasions themselves are often very brutal. The Mongols are often um, slightly more lenient as rulers rather than as invaders in large part because they want tax. And if you want tax, then you're going to have to have a healthy workforce that actually exists. So it's in your interest to do that. But nonetheless, the people are subjugated. They are in subjugation for decades, but there isn't much rebellion. And I think that's simply because there's no point. What would it achieve if a group of people tried to throw off an army that's already conquered the greater part of Eurasia? You're just going to die, and then your families will die. There's no point. So as a result, people adopt a very, very different approach to invasion, which is a great deal more pragmatic and has a much higher likelihood of success. They conduct charm offences. They know there's no point trying to achieve armed resistance. There's no point saying how much they resent their new Mongol rulers, it will achieve nothing and their new rulers don't care. So what's the point complaining about it? There is no point. So as a result, they try something rather different, charm offensives. So rather than saying, you've invaded us, you've killed members of my family, you've burnt our village or things like that, they don't say any of that. They say instead things like, you are conducting God's will. You were sent to our region because we have behaved improperly, we've sinned, and you are God's judgment on us, and we accept that, and we see a role for you in that. And so actually, the very people the Mongols have overthrown, and this is true across multiple cultures and multiple religions, lots of people are trying this. Rather than trying to resist the Mongols, they try and say nice things, things that win the Mongols' favour. 
things that legitimate the Mongols in invasions. And this might sound counterintuitive, but actually there's a strong vein of logic to it. Because if you please the Mongols, if you do win their favor, whatever they've done to you, doesn't matter. If you win their favor, then you might get yourself into a position where you can start to ask for things. If you make yourself useful, if you start administering the region that you're from, if you start facilitating the Mongols' collection of taxes, if you start saying the Mongols' invasions were legitimate in some way or building up the Mongols' own narratives, then you might be able to start asking for things. Things like, could my village be protected? Or even better, could my people group or religious group be protected? Or even better, could my people or religious group get a privileged status within the Mongol Empire, extra benefits? Or better still, could a member of my culture or religion be allowed to educate your children or to be an advisor to you? Because then you get into the area where actually you might be able to convert the Mongols to your own religion. And if you do that, suddenly things look very, very different. And so this is a process of conquering the conqueror, not by arms, but by persuasion, ingratiation, and making yourself useful to the Mongols. Multiple uh, religious traditions try this, multiple envoys try this, even if it does sound very odd to a modern ear that an invader should be greeted with a row of smiles rather than resistance. There is a logic to this. And so as a result, Mongol courts begin to become incredible places where people come from across Eurasia, trying to win the Mongols' favor, trying to convert them to their religions. And the Mongols actually hold some extraordinary faith debates where they get representatives from different religions to debate their faiths against each other. I suspect they do that partly, and this recent research has shown they do that partly as a means of control. Excuse me, but also it's because the Mongols aren't genuinely interested. And the Mongols are interested because the Mongols have their own view of religion, which is the Mongols do practice a form of religious tolerance. Now, it's not tolerance for tolerance's sake. The Mongols believe basically that they have a right, a spiritual right, to rule the entire world and all the peoples of that world. All the religions of the world, therefore, are all true enough as far as they go, but they are subordinate to the Mongols' overall mission. And so what the Mongols want from the religions and the representatives of those religions from across the planet, they want the representatives of those religions to use their spiritual power for the advancement and interests of the Mongol Empire, for the health and long life of the Mongol rulers, and for its broader prosperity. And so in that context, there is a space that religious leaders can fill to make themselves useful and to win a preferential position within the Mongol court, and many try this. But let's now move out from the position of those who are conquered by the Mongols to those who are not yet conquered. If you are a kingdom, or an empire, or a sultanate, and you are facing imminent invasion, what's your next move? Well, um, one possible approach is submission. Because when the Mongols send envoys out to countries around the world, the Mongols don't really want to invade. What the Mongols want is for people to voluntarily submit to them. They don't even have to bother invading, they just get submission anyway. And so as a result, in the 1240s, the Mongols send out emissaries to areas in the Middle East asking for just that submission. And interestingly, at the center of the map here, you can see the Kingdom of Silesian Armenia. Kingdom of Silesian Armenia is not a large place. It has a small army, nothing like strong enough to compete with the Mongols' main armies. And so Silesian Ar Armenia makes the decision to submit, but interestingly, not to submit when invaded, but to submit before invasion, long before invasion. So they submit early. 
And actually, that has a strong line of pragmatism to it, because if the Mongols invade someone and then they submit, the Mongols have no patience for that, because as far as the Mongols are concerned, they have had to use force to persuade that conquered society of the truth and righteousness of their mission to conquer the entire planet. But if a society submits before being invaded, before even nearly being invaded, the Mongols really appreciate that because they want to create an example for others to follow. And they haven't even had to commit a single soldier to that mission. So by submitting early, the Silesian Armenians were able to win a preferential treatment for themselves in the Mongol Empire, as well as a lot of concessions, because the Mongols wanted to encourage others to follow a similar course of action. So Armenia didn't even have to carry a Mongol garrison. It had to pay a tribute, but that tribute was light compared to the countries that had to be invaded before they submitted. So this is a very real option. Submission, long before invasion. And for the Armenians, at least, it works for many decades because they become a valued part of the Mongol Empire and they win quite a lot of concessions as well as protection from invasion, at least initially from the Mongols after that decision. Let's go on to the next possible response. Uh, diplomacy. This is one of my favorites because the Byzantine Empire, which by the years we're talking about, which is about 1260, the Byzantine Empire is in the process of trying to reconstitute itself. In 1261, the Byzantines will regain Constantinople, having lost it in 1204 to the Fourth Crusade. And the Byzantines also have to work out what they're going to do about the Mongols. And for them, things are particularly difficult because they have one line of Mongol armies approaching them from the east via what today we modern day Turkey, what in this era is the Anatolian Seljuk Sultanate. And they have another line of Mongol armies approaching from the north through what today would be Bulgaria, which um, will become known as the Carnage of the Golden Horde. So they're being pincered. And the Mongols, as I've mentioned, they have two choices for unconquered people. You can submit or you can face invasion. But the Byzantines, being um, very adept diplomats historically, they managed to find a third option. And that third option is to do neither. Because time after time in the 1240s and 1250s, the Mongols send envoys into the Byzantine Empire, offering them that choice, submit or face invasion, choose. But the Byzantines refused to, to make a choice. On one occasion, the Mongol envoy, envoy mysteriously dies. And the Byzantines send an envoy to the Mongol Empire saying, we have received your um, ambassador, but the ambassador has died. Can you send a new one? And of course, they know very well the journey to Mongolia and back will take probably months each way with a sizable um, gap in the middle while the Mongols work out uh, who they're going to send to the next embassy. So the Byzantines play for time. And in 1257, the Mongols send another envoy to the Byzantine Empire. And this time the Byzantines play a different game because at this point the Byzantine Empire is not large. It suffered substantial territorial losses um, in the 12, 1200s and 1210s from crusading armies, later on from the Bulgarian Empire, and also throughout this period from the Anatolian Seljuk. So it's not a large empire at all. And yet when the Mongol envoys arrive, the Byzantines take the envoys via the most circuitous route to their capital, really playing for time. And as a result, they give the impression their empire is vast because it takes weeks to cross it. And at every stage of the road, the Byzantines station troops to give the impression their army, their army is huge and their empire is vast, all of which strengthens their bargaining position. Even so, it seems like in about 1260, 
the Byzantines do adopt something um, of something of the nature of a submission to the Mongol Empire. So it doesn't last forever, although they keep them talking for as long as possible. So that's another possible response at a state level to invasion, diplomacy. In this case, the Byzantines played for time for a long period, but ultimately they did submit. Let's now look at another possible response. And I promised you here that I'd pick up the narrative uh, following the Mongol invasion into Syria in 1260. And just take a look at the map here. The Mongols control territory up to Damascus in Syria. The Ayyubid Empire of Syria has gone. The Anatolian Seljuk Sultanate, as you can see, is under Mongol hegemony. The Kingdom of Cilician Armenia is under Mongol hegemony. The northernmost Crusader state, the Principality of Antioch, is under Mongol hegemony. And so there are really only three territories left on the mainland Middle East, which still have independence. County of Tripoli, which is too small. Kingdom of Jerusalem, which is also too small to fend off a Mongol invasion. And they're trying frantically in these years to, to negotiate with the Mongols, trying to maintain their independence and prevent themselves from being invaded. The Knights Templar and Hospitaller are busily building up their strongholds, but they know perfectly well that if the major Mongol field army invading Syria, which is estimated at about 100,000 strong, invades the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which on a good day can manage about 8,000 troops, there's going to be no meaningful resistance. And then there is the Mamluk Empire of Egypt. And just to give you a sense of the balance of power here, Mongol Empire, as I mentioned, it can manage about 100,000 troops. Mamluk Empire can manage about 12,000. So things don't look promising for the Mamluk Empire. As though, sure enough, in 1260, the Mongols send envoys to the empire demanding its submission, offering the standard choice, submit or die. And here the Mamluks try something rather different, something that, as far as I, I, I found anyway from my research, no one has ever tried before. Because in the past, people have tried to fend off a Mongol invasion once it crosses their borders. But no one has ever tried to proactively march out beyond their borders and seek battle with the Mongols. That doesn't happen. But the Mamluks try it. They raise the biggest army they've got, advance out from Egypt across the Sinai Desert and into Syria, actively seeking battle with the Mongols. Now, admittedly, not everyone wants to do it. The Mamluk Sultan Qutuz, he's willing, but there are plenty of commanders who see this as simply suicide. And you can see why they would. They're marching out of their own territory, away from their own defences, against an army that outnumbers them almost 10 to 1. But it is a fresh approach. The Mongols aren't expecting it. And perhaps because they're not expecting it, that helps to explain what happens next. Because rather than meeting a full-scale Mongol invasion army head-on, the Mamluks meet a rather smaller force. Because at this time, news arrives in the Middle East that the Great Khan, remember the Great Khan is also the Mongol commander in Syria's brother, the Great Khan has died. And so his brother, Hulugu, leaves Syria and moves east towards Azerbaijan, in order that he can make sure that he's close to the succession, he can make sure that his voice is heard when it comes to the selection of the next great Khan. And here's the crucial point. He takes the vast majority of his army with him, leaving a garrison of 20,000 troops to hold Syria. He's not expecting to be invaded. Now, the Mamluks don't know this when they invade, when they advance out of Egypt, but events certainly work in their favour. 
because the Mamluks meet the Mongols at the Battle of Ain Jalut. You can see it marked on the map here. It uh, takes place near to Lake Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. Um, and you can see that marked on the map. And the Mamluks win that battle. And this is an interesting moment. The Mongols have been defeated before in battle. It can occasionally happen, but it's not frequent. And those who successfully defeat a Mongol army are nearly always submerged straight away afterwards by a massive counterattack. So the, Mo so the Mongols are very likely to counterattack soon afterwards. The Mamluks know this. And yet the Mamluks remain on the offensive and they manage to conquer Damascus. Then they advance north to Aleppo and both those cities pretty much hand themselves over to the Mamluks because they want a new defender against the Mongols. And so the Mamluk Empire doubles in size very quickly. And the river Euphrates, you can see it marked on the map, becomes the frontier of war between the Mamluk Empire and the Mongol Empire. But here's the question. When are the Mongols coming back? And again, events play out in the Mamluks' favour because this is the moment when the Mongol Empire descends into civil war. Basically, arguments over the division, who gets to be governor of which part of the empire, along with a succession dispute fo following the death of the previous great Khan, causes a massive civil war. And two of the leading protagonists in that war are Hulagu, who rules the Middle East, and his rival to the north, the Khan of the Golden Horde. And they fight a series of big battles against each other. And the main upshot of that is it's 20 years before the Mongols are able to return in force. And in that 20 year period, the Mamluks build up their army. They fortify the river Euphrates on its western bank. And they use their army, essentially train their army by virtually destroying what's left of the Crusader states, which has lacks the military strength to resist their um, advances. And so when the Mongols reinvade in 12, 1280 to 1281, the Mamluks are ready for them. And they're still outnumbered, but they're very competent. And they then defeat the Mongols at the Battle of Homs. You can see Homs marked on the map. And that is really the big battle where the Mamluks defeat the Mongols at full strength. And that, for Mamluks at least, proves to anyone who's watching, which is pretty much everyone, that they can realistically defeat the Mongols. And so at that point, well, and indeed to some extent before it as well, all sorts of refugee peoples or peoples who are still holding out for their independence begin to align themselves with the Mamluks because here at last is someone with a proven ability to defeat the Mongols in battle. And the Mamluks then use their growing military strength, firstly to destroy what's left of the Crusader states in 1291, and then they conduct an an ongoing war against the Mongols, which carries on till 1323, when a peace agreement is hammered out, and that is the end of the Mongol invasions into the Middle East. So another response, not just a military response from the Mamluks, but an aggressive military response, seeking battle with the Mongols, and then being assertive um, f following that moment. These are the approaches that work for those who fought against the Mongols. But there is one other strategy that warrants attention. And that is evasion and retrenchment. Because we've already mentioned some people become subjugated by the Mongols. Some people submitted to them. Some people conducted diplomacy with them. And in the Mamluks case, some people took aggressive action against them. And they all fared differently. They all had different strategies. But there is another group of people that needs to be considered. And that is the tens, probably hundreds, possibly millions of people who moved westwards to get out of the Mongols' way. Huge columns of refugees trying to get away from the Mongols' advance, and you can see why they would. 
Some go to the Crusader states, which takes in some refugees. Some go to the Mamluk Empire, which takes in some refugees. And some go into Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. And it's them that I want to focus on. Because within the various peoples who have been forced to move westwards are lots of nomadic communities, particularly Turkmen nomads. And they are nomadic peoples. They'll move west with their herds and their flocks, horses, sheep, goats, and other animals. And because they're nomadic and can carry their civilization with them, they can be quite effective at relocating themselves in a way that the inhabitants of a city or an agricultural society will struggle because they have to leave their place of work or their fields in order to move. But nomads can move quite effectively. And so as a result, there is a clustering of Turkmen groups, Turkmen nomads, in central and western Anatolia. And the Mongols know this. And the Mongols repeatedly invade central and western Anatolia, trying to crush these Turkmen groups, or they try and force their client, the Anatolian Seljuks, to do it for them, which isn't really that effective. And yet the Turkmen manage to hold out against the Mongols simply because they, well, they sometimes fight the Mongols and typically lose, but often they just stay out of the way and get out of the way of an invading army. And they carry on doing that until the Mongols are weaken, at which point they can fight them in battle, or until the Mongols cease to try and impose their will on Anatolia. So you have this belt of strong Turkmen groups in central and western Anatolia, and in time they come to rule geographical areas of Anatolia. And these small principalities, or Beyliks as they're known, they take often take the name of their ruling dynasty. And one particular uh, ruling dynasty called the Karamanids, they prove very effective. And there's another ruling dynasty too, which becomes very powerful on the Byzantine borders in northern Anatolia. And that dynasty is called the Ottomans. And yes, these are the roots of the Ottoman Empire. And it does seem likely that in their deep origins, at least some, at least of the Ottomans, um, Turkmen supporters, maybe the Ottomans themselves, were originally a family trying to get out of the Mongols' way, moving westwards, building up a position for themselves in central Anatolia. And of course, from this moment, the Ottomans begin to expand both into the Byzantine Empire, but also against other Beyliks into central Anatolia until the Ottoman Empire has built itself up to the point at which it can expand rapidly into what will become the Ottoman Empire that spans much of the Mediterranean, the Balkans, and the Middle East. But it's interesting to look at the strategies being used. So let's consider some of these strategies in the long term. Well, the Silesian Armenians survive as long as the Mongol Empire is intact. But when the Mongol Empire turns in on itself and fights these big civil wars, it's exposed. And Silesian Armenia falls to the Mamluks in 1375. The Mamluk Empire itself survives into the 16th century. The Turkmen um, Beyliks, subsequently the Ottomans, obviously they continue to survive until the 20th century. So we're looking here at a crucial moment in Middle Eastern history, one that has substantial repercussions that extend way beyond this period, right the way ultimately into the modern era. But I want to reflect on this a little bit because I also want to think a little bit about the decision-making processes involved. Let's imagine, heaven forfend, that we should face the invasion of an invading army. Whoever we are, wherever we're based, I'm aware that people may be joining us from around the world. 
what would seem like a proportionate response to invasion? Well, I've always felt that people would typically do the following. They would gather information about the invader, conduct diplomacy with the invader, build up their own defences, and then, if invaded, try and defend those borders against the invader. And that might be described as a proportionate response. It feels logical. There's a progression to it. It doesn't feel unnecessarily provocative. It makes sense. It's quite morally defensible. You can see the stages of that process. Here's my point. The societies that tried that approach in this era and this region got destroyed. The ones that survived, whether in the short term, the medium term or the long term, they responded in a disproportionate way. In that they tried to submit even before they were threatened or they actually took the offensive. These are the societies that survive. Other societies that survive include those who simply uproot and get out of the way in a way that would be difficult for many modern day societies. But I think here I'm coming to my point, really, which is or a point that I draw from this, which is that in times of peace and relatively harmonious conditions. Pragmatic, prudential, carefully staged decision making makes sense. But in times of crisis, actually, the dividends of that kind of decision making no longer pay off. And actually, decisions that seem proportionate, knee-jerk, get accused of leaping before they've looked, sometimes at least, those types of decisions pay off better. And so this is an important point for me because it gets me thinking about different kinds of environments and different places in which different kinds of decisions work and in which, which different kinds of decisions don't. And so, I don't know, this is a reflection that I have acquired from looking at these events. That brings me to the end of my talk. If you'd like to know a little bit more about me and my research, you want to read some of my books. I've recently published The Mongol Storm, which is a history of the Mongol invasions into the Middle East. I've also published extensively on the history of the Crusades and various other societies in the Middle East in this era. So there's the Crusader states and their neighbors and military history. Uh, the Field of Blood, which is an account of a major battle that took place within the context of the Crusades, and a general history of the military orders. That's the Knights Templar, Hospitaller, Teutonic Knights. You might also be interested in my YouTube channel, which can be found with the handle at Medieval Near East. But I do hope that you've enjoyed today's talk um, and uh, found, it, found it interesting. And so it's been great to speak to you all, and I wish you all a very good night.